In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today, let us contemplate the Immaculate Conception of our Blessed Mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, how it came to about its purposes, and what we may do to imitate it. We begin with the fall of Satan. Satan's fall came about through pride, through a love of himself. We see this in Ezekiel 28. Thou wast the seal of resemblance, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou wast in the pleasures of paradise of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, gold the work of thy beauty, and thy pipes were prepared in the day that thou wast created. Thou a cherubim stretched out and protecting, and I set thee in the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day of thy creation, until iniquity was found in thee. St. Gregory the Great writes that, without any doubt, the angel sinned by wanting to be like God. But we may ask, how was this accomplished? How does one go about doing that? Did Satan wake up one morning and say, you know, being an angel is nice, but I think I would be better at being God. You know, like maybe if God goes to the store, it can run in and steal his chair. No. Um, What happened was this proud spirit became ensnared by his own beauty and made himself his own end. Saying, as we see in Isaiah, I will ascend above the height of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. He was not first so much envious of God as he glorified in himself. Think about this. Satan was the most beautiful thing that God had made. The most beautiful creation. And himself knowing this and seeing this, He fell in love with his own beauty, because we love what is beautiful. And this beauty, too, was not just physical beauty, or it wasn't physical beauty at all. It was spiritual beauty. And what is spiritual beauty but a beautiful intellect and a beautiful will? His mind and his heart were made beautiful and resplendent, adorned with all the spiritual gifts that God could give this creature. But because of his pride, because of his will, he was immediately brought down to hell. Again in Isaiah, that thou shalt be brought down to hell into the depth of the pit. In an instant, in the blink of an eye, all is lost for Satan. By loving first his own beauty and secondly his creator. Satan upsets the divine order and is instantly darkened, blackened. His eye is obscured with evil, his heart forever set on the impossible, and filled with hatred because of it. Which brings us to our feast today. Mary, the woman prophesied in Genesis, who would crush the head, the pride of the serpent, is conceived perfectly pure and beautiful. Like Satan at his own creation, she is full of grace, adorned with all virtue, with all spiritual beauty. Like Satan, she is destined for great things, to be the closest creature to God. There is no creature now closer to the triune God in heaven than Mary. No angel can see God as Mary sees God. How was Our Lady's victory over Satan accomplished? How does one win victory over any enemy? (coughs) Mary was full of virtue. So was Satan. Mary was created beautiful and pure from the first moment of her conception. A sparkling diamond. But so was Satan. Mary defeats Satan through humility. It is not through intellectual prowess. For he fell even for all that. What virtue, again, was there not in Satan? Was he not courageous? Was he not filled with many spiritual goods? Was there, was it for lack of any virtue? 
It was not for lack of any virtue, but one, humility. And thus, lacking only humility, it is humility, by humility, that Mary overcomes Satan. The devil has no defense against humility. When you study martial arts, one of the best ways of learning how to defend against a certain attack is to learn how to perform that same attack yourself. If you can do it, you know what it feels like, you know how to respond to it. You're not caught off guard. But the devil has no humility. And having none, he has no defense against its use. You can argue and think as much against the devil as you want, and he'll come back at you. But he can't combat humility. What virtuous man cannot the devil pervert? The devil can inflame those who are faithful, those who are hopeful, the charitable, the wise, the courageous, the generous. Any virtue can be lost and perverted simply by the possessor glorying in it, by attributing it, attributing it to ourselves and not to God. Now, obviously and thankfully, we differ quite a lot from the angels, that we do things slowly and by degrees, and so we can slip here or there without falling completely off the edge. Whereas the angels, it's instantaneous. It's all or nothing. Again, this means that our greatest defense against the devil is humility. Whenever we are attacked, whenever we are tempted, humility. If someone is angry with us, we are tempted to reach for anger in return. No, humility. When we are tempted to enter near occasions of sin because of our own perceived strength and discipline, no, humility. When Satan sinned by pride, he suffered. How often does our own pride make us suffer? I'm too good to be treated this way. I deserve better. I can't stand how I'm being treated. I'm being insulted. Even if they are real insults, is it not only our pride that makes them painful? And what does humility consist? Many things. But look to Mary. Look to perfect humility in the perfect creature. St. Alphonsus de Ligori describes it, or at least the first aspect of our Blessed Mother's humility, in this. He says, Mary always thought so lowly of herself, as was revealed to St. Matilda, that although she saw so many more graces bestowed upon her than upon others, she preferred all others before herself. Not that the Holy Virgin esteemed herself a sinner, for humility is truth. And Mary knew that she had never offended God, nor that she did not confess having received greater graces from God than any other creature, for a humble heart always acknowledges the special favors of the Lord, that it may humble itself the more. But the Divine Mother, by the great light she had to see the infinite greatness and goodness of her God, saw still more her own littleness. And therefore, more than all others, did she humiliate herself. Mary, the more she saw herself enriched, the more humble she became, remembering that all was the gift of God. Says St. Bernardine, no creature in the world has been more exalted because no creature has ever humbled herself more than Mary. Again, Mary says to St. Bridget, Why did I humble myself so far? Why have I merited so much grace unless because I thought and knew that of and from myself I was nothing and had nothing? Therefore, I would have no praise for myself, but only for the giver and creator. Consider this as well. True humility is not in putting oneself last, at least not in an external sense, but in not putting oneself anywhere at all, letting oneself be placed last, first, middle, wherever. 
Remember that false humility of Agaz. Told to ask for a sign, he refuses. False humility calls attentions to itself, stumbles around awkwardly, like everyone in the cafeteria line, all trying to be the last person. It's just going to be a mess. It's through pride that one claims his own place. It's through humility that the saints have let themselves be exalted, named bishops, popes, abbots. But it's the same humility through which they were made the least of men as martyrs. We remember that the martyrs were the least of men, surrounded by their enemies, not their friends at their death, given low places as doorkeepers, dishwashers, and so on, treated as the off-scouring of the earth. Satan saw himself in first place, but lost sight of him who put him there. He saw himself as worthy of such a place, as deserving such honor, as the greatest of all creatures, and loved his place more than he who placed him there. Again, Mary knew the prophecies. She knew that she was pure and sinless. But she never suspected that she was chosen as the mother of God because she placed herself in God's hands, not her own. Because she has eyes only for God and his glory. And when she looks to herself, she is not lost in the beauty of her own virtue, but sees herself only and always in comparison to God. It is hard for us to comprehend anyone so pure as our Blessed Mother, with no attachment to sin, no desire for sin, no sins of weakness, not even any imperfections. But equally so, or I would say even more so, it is hard to, com- hard to comprehend one who is so great and yet so humble. We cannot be Mary. We cannot be free from all sin or from all the effects of sin. But we can be humble. When conflict comes, dig deep into humility. Enjoy humility. What claim do I have on my own joy? In sorrow, humility. What claim do I have to any joy at all? In all things, may we never lose the sight of God May we see ourselves not in comparison to each other, but to God. And how often are we tempted to do this? Well, at least I'm not bad as so-and-so. But these thoughts, how foreign they are to Mary's mind. Your brother's sins? What of it? How do you stand before God? At the end of the Roman canon, the priest prays a great prayer. In English, it goes, as he makes the sign of the cross with the host over the chalice, he says, by him and with him and in him is to thee, God, the Father Almighty, making the sign of the cross twice between himself and the chalice with the host, Almighty in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory, omnis honor et gloria, At the very end of the canon, the priest offers all honor and glory to God. How good we would be if we could truly say that prayer every day of our lives. Omnis honor and glory, all honor and glory, means all. It doesn't mean some or a little. It doesn't mean a lot, but all. It doesn't mean leaving a little bit for myself. How often we're like, well, let me give most of the glory to God, but I want my place. I want to be recognized. No. Omnis, honor and gloria. All honor and glory. Our Blessed Mother prayed this prayer with her whole being from the very moment of her immaculate conception. Let us implore her aid that we may pray it truly and more and more every day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.